Internally, he is widely known as Madman Yu, because he constantly comes up with crazy ideas that make him enemies within Huawei. Externally, he's the man some love to hate, known as Big Mouth Yu, always boasting and exaggerating. During one product launch event, he famously used the phrase, far ahead, six times to describe Huawei products. Since childhood, his father always taught him, be humble and cautious in life, like wheat, the lower the head, the fuller the grains, the higher the head, the more empty the husk. However, throughout his life, he has presented himself with a different attitude, his head held high, yet still full. Born in 1969 in a poor rural family in Huichou County, Anhui Province, China, he is now 54 years old. Starting in 1993, this year marks his 30th year with Huawei. During these three decades, he has witnessed Huawei's remarkable rise and stood by the company through numerous crises. Some admire him, while others detest him. He never stopped running, and in every decision, he displayed clarity, unwavering determination, and an absolute refusal to compromise. Yes, he is the person I want to introduce today, Yu Chengdong, a person I deeply respect. Let's begin. On August 4, 2023, during a Huawei product launch event, Yu Chengdong, the executive director of Huawei, used the word return with profound meaning when referring to Huawei smartphones. He said, our flagship Huawei smartphones are on the path of return. Looking back at the past four years, we have overcome countless difficulties, and now, as we look back, the light boat has passed through a thousand mountains. Over the past four years, as the architect of Huawei's smartphone empire, Yu Chengdong has experienced the darkest moments of his life. His grand plans for Huawei smartphones were overturned, leaving only one goal, survival. 25 days later, with no prior teasers, Huawei launched the highly anticipated Mate 60 Pro, branding it as the most powerful Mate phone. Following the sanctions imposed on Huawei, the company had previously released the Mate 50 series in 2022, a phone without the Kirin chipset and lacking 5G capability. Compared to other smartphones, it appeared lackluster, and its sales suffered significantly. So, when Huawei unveiled the Mate 60 Pro, the burning questions on everyone's mind were, what chipset does it use, and does it support 5G? Surprisingly, Huawei did not disclose any relevant information, even Yu Chengdong, who is known for touting Huawei as, far ahead, remained tight-lipped. Tech bloggers who managed to get their hands on the phone quickly initiated a frenzied and time-sensitive, teardown movement, and the answer soon emerged, the latest Mate 60 Pro is equipped with the new Kareen 9000S chipset and, based on actual measurements, its internet speed meets 5G standards. Foreign tech institutions even hailed it as a milestone in Chinese design and manufacturing. All of this points to an incredibly uplifting outcome, Kirin is back, and 5G has returned. This conclusion rapidly ignited public excitement. Since its launch, the Huawei Mate 60 Pro has already received orders for over 15 million units, and this number continues to surge daily. After all, for Huawei and its followers, this is not just the launch of a new phone, it signifies that Huawei, once bound and constrained, has finally broken free from its restraints and is running again. In interviews, when asked about the topic of sanctions, he publicly shed tears for the first time. Many sleepless nights were spent walking alone on the streets, and his once black hair had rapidly turned white over the past two years. During the presentation, he no longer mentioned being the world's number one, but rather opted for, it's also good. It seems that even the charismatic, big mouth Yu has had to temporarily bow down to reality. In 1987, Yu Chengdong, with the highest scores in the county science stream, enrolled in the Department of Automatic Control at Northwestern Polytechnical University. Prior to this, no student from his Huichio County No. 2 middle school had ever made it to university. It was also in that year that Ren Jingfei, scraping together 22,000 renminbi, established Huawei in a simple room in Shenzhen. After graduating from college, Yu Chengdong worked at the university for two years and then gained admission to Tsinghua University as a graduate student through self-study. During a holiday break, he came to Shenzhen and was drawn to the city's freedom and vitality. He applied for a job at Huawei, which had only 200 employees at the time, and successfully passed the interview. In this way, in 1993, 
the 24-year-old Yu Chengdong officially joined Huawei as a technician with a monthly salary of 800 renminbi. At that time, no one could have imagined that this young man from Anhui, who spoke with a thick Anhui accent and had a hearty laugh, would later become the key figure in Huawei's dramatic journey. Although Huawei was initially established as a technology company, the majority of its revenue came from trading. When Yu Chengdong joined, Huawei was in the midst of transitioning and planning to develop its own communication equipment. Yu Chengdong became one of the developers of Huawei's first-generation digital program controlled exchange, deeply involved in Huawei's first major project, the development of the C and C08 exchange. Although the exchange developed by Huawei at that time was still quite rough, the Chinese market was large. Ren Jingfei formulated a rural encirclement of the city's strategy which sent Huawei employees from Shenzhen to towns and villages across the country to expand the market for the exchange. Ren Jingfei's plan quickly paid off, and the exchange project achieved the expected profits. Yu Chengdong was promoted and received a raise, and his future looked very promising. However, Yu Chengdong was not satisfied with this. In 1998, he switched tracks and created the wireless communication department within Huawei, focusing on 3G business. At that time, no one had much confidence in this business. Firstly, because the telecommunications industry had a high technological barrier, and most of the Chinese market was dominated by telecom giants from developed countries. Secondly, this research and development required an investment of 6 billion renminbi, equivalent to one-third of Huawei's R&D budget. However, Ren Jingfei decided to support Yu Chengdong in this endeavor. In 2003, Yu Chengdong took a product that had been in development for four years and went to Europe to try to open up markets in developed countries. However, Huawei had little reputation, was relatively small in size, and almost no company was willing to cooperate with it. After several months of being turned away, a struggling small French telecom operator finally agreed to work with Huawei. During the negotiation process, Yu Chengdong discovered that the 3G base station designs used internationally were very cumbersome and required cranes for transportation, resulting in extremely high maintenance costs. He made a quick decision to lead a team to develop a split-type base station. This decision faced significant opposition within Huawei because the previous round of development had not yet yielded a return on the 6 billion renminbi investment, and committing to a new round of R&D carried significant risks. Many people couldn't understand why Yu Chengdong was so insistent. They asked, everyone else in the world is using this base station design, and it's working just fine. Why do we need to change it? Yu Chengdong became frustrated and pounded the table during a meeting, saying, we must do it, or we'll fall behind Ericsson. In the end, Ren Jingfei decided to take another gamble, and it proved to be the right choice. In just six months, Yu Chengdong led his team to develop a split-type base station with stronger signals and a smaller footprint. This innovation garnered significant attention, and Huawei secured a $25 million order with a Dutch company, establishing Huawei's reputation in Europe. Yu Chengdong continued to build on this success, and in 2007 developed a fourth-generation base station that could share 2G, 3G, and 4G, solidifying Huawei's position. In 2012, Huawei signed contracts with 12 out of the 15 major European telecom operators, achieving a 33% market share in the European wireless communications market. Undoubtedly, Huawei had reached its peak at this point. The next step was to figure out how to maintain that peak and find even higher ground. In 2011, while Yu Chengdong was making strides in the European and American markets, Ren Jingfei issued an order transferring him back to take charge of Huawei's smartphone business. Prior to this, Huawei's smartphone business had gone through three different leaders but had shown little progress. Around 2000, the Chinese smartphone market began to rapidly expand, with brands like Motorola, Ericsson, Sharp, Nokia, and others vying for market share. In late 2002, Ren Jingfei decided to invest 1 billion renminbi to enter the smartphone industry. Despite Huawei's dominant position in the carrier services sector, it was a newcomer in the smartphone field. In the initial years, Huawei primarily produced white-label, OEM, and feature phones, which performed reasonably well. However, as 3G communication became widespread and more high-performance branded smartphones entered the market, 
Huawei smartphone shipments declined year by year. In 2011, Yu Chengdong took on this challenging role. Ren Jingfei knew better than anyone that when Yu Chengdong set his mind to something, he would go all out and stop at nothing to achieve his goals. However, what happened next was unexpected. Yu Chengdong, known for his aggressive approach, decided to make a radical change, he axed 90% of Huawei's white label, feature phone, and low-end phone business, determined to enter the high-end market. He said, we should at least become the Audi or Porsche of the smartphone industry. This decision by Yu Chengdong resulted in a sudden drop in Huawei's smartphone shipments by 30 million units, and a rapid decline in revenue. Internal disagreements escalated to the point where some even placed protest letters on Ren Jingfei's desk, forcing him to publicly declare. Not supporting Yu Chengdong means not supporting me. In 2012, Yu Chengdong and his team launched Huawei's first smartphone. This phone was notoriously difficult to use, frequently experienced crashes, was slow, and overheated. Ren Jingfei was so frustrated with it that he threw the phone at Yu Chengdong's face. That year, only 500,000 units of this phone were sold, and because it didn't meet its targets, Yu Chengdong's year-end bonus was cancelled. In early 2013, Yu Chengdong continued his pursuit and launched another smartphone, but it met with the same fate of failure. Inside Huawei, there were rumors that Yu Chengdong might be removed from his position. After all, the profitability of the smartphone business he oversaw was lower than the interest rates offered by banks. Depositing the money in a bank would yield higher returns than the smartphone business. Despite repeated failures, Yu Chengdong refused to give up. He began by emulating Xiaomi's Lei Jun and created his own Weibo account to directly communicate with consumers. He also instructed his design and development staff to leave their computers and go to the stores to experience the work of salespeople, and listen to customer complaints about Huawei phones. In his last-ditch effort, Yu Chengdong not only dedicated all his time to work but also pushed his employees relentlessly. At that time, he often called his employees late at night to discuss issues related to smartphone development. Simultaneously, Yu Chengdong recruited talent from companies like Nokia and Samsung. With such an extensive effort, in June 2013, Huawei P6, the product of all Yu Chengdong's efforts, was officially launched. The P6 had a thickness of just 6.18 mm, making it the thinnest smartphone in the world at the time. Yu Chengdong was extremely confident in this phone. Before the P6, Huawei had never sold more than a million units of a single smartphone model, but this time, before its release, Yu Chengdong had prepared 3 million units. That year, the Huawei P6 eventually sold for a million units, marking Yu Chengdong's impressive comeback. Huawei's smartphone business finally embarked on a new and rapid upward trajectory, entering its golden age. However, the subsequent developments were beyond anyone's imagination. In 2013, after achieving some success, Yu Chengdong announced at a press conference that Huawei smartphones would surpass Apple within two years and surpass Samsung within five years. Among his most famous statements, he used the phrase, far ahead, six times to describe Huawei products at a single press conference. Following the success of the P6, Huawei introduced other products like the P6s and P7, which also performed exceptionally well. In 2018, Huawei's smartphone sales exceeded 200 million units, making it the number one brand in the Chinese market. That year, Huawei's global market share of 17.6% surpassed Apple making it the world's second-largest smartphone manufacturer, behind only Samsung. In April 2020, Huawei's market share surpassed Samsung's, making it the world's number one smartphone brand. The subsequent events in Huawei's story are still fresh in people's memories. In May 2019, the United States placed Huawei and its 70 affiliates on the entity list, citing national security concerns. This move restricted American companies from selling products and technology to Huawei without approval. Subsequently, the U.S. imposed additional sanctions in May and August 2020, effectively crippling Huawei's chip supply chain. In March 2021, the U.S. sanctions were escalated once again, restricting semiconductor suppliers from providing 5G equipment to Huawei that contained U.S. technology. This meant that even though Huawei had the largest number of 5G patents globally, its smartphones released thereafter could not feature 5G technology. In 2021, 
at the Mate 50 launch event, Yu Chengdong no longer talked about being far ahead. He said, as everyone knows, due to four rounds of US sanctions, we can only use our 5G chips as 4G chips. He added, the new chips we're using are still good, and that's fine. However, the Mate 50, which did not feature Kirin chips and lacked 5G capability, disappointed consumers, leading to dismal sales that year. In 2021, Huawei's smartphone shipments fell out of the global top five and were relegated to the others category in sales charts. This period was one of the darkest moments for Yu Chengdong and Huawei as a whole. In interviews, when asked about Huawei smartphones under US sanctions, Yu Chengdong would lower his head and wipe away tears. Many people advised him to give up, believing that there was little chance for Huawei smartphones to make a comeback under the current circumstances. However, Yu Chengdong refused to compromise. Over the past two years, he worked even longer hours, often walking on the streets late at night until dawn before returning to work, facing the increasing challenges head on. Fortunately, the darkness gradually began to dissipate. It seems that after overcoming numerous obstacles, Huawei has finally entered a new and expansive landscape. While striving to lift the smartphone business out of the quagmire, Huawei has also been exploring other avenues. In 2021, Yu Chengdong led a team into the field of new energy vehicles, expressing great confidence. My dream is not to have all the cars on the road be Huawei's, but to have Huawei's technology in every smart car, regardless of the brand. When it comes to the new energy vehicles he's involved in producing, Yu Chengdong is still brimming with enthusiasm, saying, Compared to the new players and Tesla, we are far ahead. Now, a new round of sowing and growth has begun, and no one knows how Huawei's harvest will be in the field of new energy vehicles. We wish Huawei, Mr. Yu, and far ahead all the best. That concludes our sharing for today, and we'll see you in the next time.